Hey guys, welcome back to our neck of the woods. In today's video, we're gonna show you what we've done after just one month since we broke ground. And if you remember, I'm pretty much the one building the house. Uh, I've had my buddy Rob out here a few times. I've had my dad out here a few times and I had a few days of Randall, the concrete guy out here. So we're gonna show you what we've done in a month. We're also about ready to hit our kind of first milestone. We're almost at a 100 subscribers and we're going to show you what needs done still because on saturday we are going to go ahead and pour the garage and we're going to go ahead and pour the house uh, walls so one month in here's where we pretty much stand we've got all of the icf walls up as you can see uh, this week the bracing was delivered and the garage is all fully braced up we went ahead and finally cut out and determined where the garage doors are going to be and if you don't remember we have got a 18 foot uh, dual car garage and we've got a nine foot single car garage uh, i don't know if you're familiar with garage doors but i think typically you're only looking at about a 16 foot garage door for a dual car so looking at this eight footer i don't know how well it shows up on camera but man that thing is massive uh, we've got enough here in between for kind of a uh, split that we can go ahead and pour plenty of concrete in there uh, to reinforce that so it won't fall or be uh, it'll be structurally sound enough for where this wall comes down here to where it splits the garage door and then a nine foot single car is more than enough room to pull anything in so that when I have a lift in there, I can go ahead and work on my vehicle, friends, vehicles, etc. Uh, we also spent a heck of a lot of time getting this French drain in. And if you're wondering, yes, it is working. Obviously, there's no water down in this section in here because this is the high point. Everything kind of has been flowing underneath of the French drain back there to the sump pump T where it goes into the basement uh, we did get several inches of rain over the last few days um, the sump pump has been working beautifully uh, it has filled up at least five to six times and I've had to pump it out which is about 22 gallons again only pretty much this backside over here the French drain's been filling up with water most of it is under the French drain in the stone that the French drain is sitting on. So since not a lot of the water has been coming in through uh, the actual pipe, it's running in under the stone, going in under the stone here, going down the stone, and then coming into the pipe that's going in there and then kind of weeping up through the holes and then coming in. Also, the water that's been sitting in the basement stone that is also funneling down in and has been coming in to the sump pump. And if you look right now, after five to six times of draining that, I would say right now there's a good seven, eight inches of water in there that I've got to pump out. In fact, you can actually see lines where the water's been up, where there's some foam pellets that have been sitting. The water only gets up to where the top of the stone is to right there and then I empty it out because again, all of this water right now is filtering in through this point here, going down through this stone and then kind of leaching in where I've not siliconed that pipe yet. And that's not a necessity for right now because obviously I want all this water to get in there so that I can pump it out. Also, as you can see, we got our egress windows in and as you've noticed, they are not going to be below ground. The county did come back and say that as long as I permanently affix something like a step on the inside, we do not need to uh, get this below grade for a typical egress window. And what I mean by that is, if you missed the last video, I had asked the county, they say that from the top of here to the finished floor, needs to be no more than 44 inches. Well, I really didn't want to have to deal with these windows, dealing with those T's outside, which they are no longer going to be needed. We can go ahead and put a cap on those T's under each one of the windows. 
Um, I didn't want to have to worry about those catch basins. I didn't want to have to backfill all that with stone, constantly clean out all of the stone from leaves and debris and molds going to grow down in there and it'd just be a big pain in the butt. So again, the county approved that once I pour the basement slab, which will need to come up with sand, will need to come up two inches with foam and then four inches of concrete. In front of these windows, I'm basically going to make a concrete step. The step is going to be no different than a normal step. It's going to come out 10 inches or so. It's going to be about seven and a half inches tall. So from that concrete footer right there, we're going to be coming up 13 and a half inches. So when you walk up to this window, you simply step up on the one step and then you'll be 44 inches from the bottom of this wood sill plate that you can go ahead and step on outside. So again, the county approved that. So we no longer have to worry about these windows basically flooding because the grading is low enough that it'll grade off. And the only water that'll get up to that window, I guess, technically, is if a raindrop hits, it can backsplash up. But we'll go ahead and waterproof that and we do not have to worry about it. As you can see, we also got all the bracing up for the inside of the basement. Unfortunately, uh, me and the bracing guy that I rented from, we had talked about numbers a few times and he ended up bringing me 32 braces. But my last text to him was that I needed 34. Uh, the paperwork says 32, he brought 32, but again, I need 34. So in this corner right here, we're actually missing a brace for here and we're missing a brace for here. So he does need to bring two more out so we can finish this wall. If you also notice, we got our plate started. I still need to finish the outside and I still need to finish, uh, one more needs to go there, one more needs to go there. We need to remove these braces and put them in. And then we need to finish the back wall and we need to finish the garage wall over here. Now, how these plates work, I know my dad was asking and he wanted to be out here for them. So unfortunately, he won't be here because we're gonna pour on Saturday and they're all gonna be done. But basically, I'll show a video here in a second. I came out here at about oh, 11 o'clock at night, pitch black, set up my laser level right here up on a ladder and adjusted that till I got exactly in that corner, 14 inches down. Turned on the laser level and then I went around this entire perimeter and made a line on that laser, which of course at night you can see like there's no tomorrow. And I measured 14 inches down. These walls have not been compressed yet because there's no concrete in them. And sometimes when you pour the concrete or when you've installed these, some of these are hammered down a little bit more. So the top, you don't just want to go 14 inches down because these walls can go like this until the concrete's poured. Now, when we go ahead and put the finished floor in, we'll make sure all of the, um, the main beam running across here, which you can see, I already started the beam pocket over there. So the main beam that's running this way and the floor joist that'll run this way, we'll go ahead and make sure that that's all perfect and level. But right now I just need to get a rough idea of what 14 inches down. So that's why we went from that corner, 14 inches down, marked it with a laser level. And then the bottom of these plates are all at 14 inches. So again, how these work is I basically marked all the way on these walls, got my uh, level and find out roughly where the bottom of that is. When you're marking this plate and you turn it around this way, these points here are on the opposite sides. So you mark them here and you mark them there, turn the plate around and then the protrusion points are facing the right way. Basically, I'm just cutting a little sliver here with a uh, knife and then hammering these things in with my fist. Now my dad asked, how the heck are these gonna stay in there? Well, if you notice, they've got some pretty big uh, ribs on them. So when you only cut the foam, the thickness of the uh, knife, and you go ahead and push these in, these ribs on each one of these plates protrude out pretty far. So I'll actually do one install for you on video, but when you're actually pushing these things in, I mean, you are hitting them to the point where you feel like you're gonna break your hand. They're not going anywhere. Even if they were to slide out just ever so slightly, when we pour the walls, 
you'll simply have the concrete guy pouring in the concrete. You'll have another guy vibrating the concrete, and then you can have a third guy or the, even the vibrator guy coming by and basically just hitting those in in case they push out a little bit more. So again, I promise you, when you see the video, you'll see how hard I hit these things. They are not going to come out. Also, somebody asked me, do you need any rebar or anything in here? Uh, the answer is no. These holes are large enough that the concrete will flow down through them. And once that hardens, because of these ribs, because of these huge two inch holes where the concrete will flow through on both the top plate and the bottom plate, it'll be concreted in and they'll never go anywhere ever. All right, so how we're installing these plates, again, I've already made a mark on here, 14 inches down with the laser all the way around. So all we need to do is basically get just a general idea of where the bottom of 14 inches is gonna be. And this first plate here is 24 inches off the corner, and then they're 48 inches down from there. So we know we're gonna be right about here. We go ahead and make a mark. That'll be the 14 inches down. Then we take our Simpson plate and we set it up to where the 24 inch on center will basically be where my mark is up here. Then we're, we're gonna mark the opposite of where these plates are now because again, this plate is gonna get turned around and it needs to be installed here. So we need a mark here and here and not a mark here and here. And if you measure from corner to corner and corner to corner, you know that the plate is not gonna extend beyond these, so you don't have to cut that. Now we go ahead and take our wife's butter knife because it has a really thick back strap, which makes the plate install a little bit easier because you're removing a little bit more foam, but it is super thin on this side, so the, the fitment is extremely tight. So all you have to do is cut from the end to the end of the lines that you just made. Now I know this is gonna move this camera really well and you're probably not gonna see a lot, but I promise you when I hit this thing in, it is gonna be absolutely hard and these plates are not coming out or going anywhere. There you go. Like I said, how hard I have to hit that thing the foam is going to hold that in around those uh, ribs that are going up over. That thing ain't going nowhere. Now the beauty about these plates is how they work. As you can see, my line down here, you can see I'm a little bit below and I'm even a little bit crooked, but that's okay. There's other plates on the market where your floor joists sit directly on that plate. So as you're hammering that in, if you're off kilter or anything, or too high or too low, that means your entire floor joist is gonna be off. This is almost dummy proof because it does not matter if this plate's too low, doesn't matter if this plate is turned one way or another, because these are the plates that are gonna hold on the ledger system. It's these plates here that when you set an LVL beam in there, that LVL beam sits in between these two blades and then all those holes there get a self-tapping bolt that goes through there, through the wood, and it self-taps into this steel plate. And then this thing is not gonna go anywhere once this is bolted up. The reason why it's almost dummy proof to install these is because as you can see, those eight holes match that plate no matter if I'm too low, if I'm too high, if I'm off kilter, it doesn't matter. 
as long as you install the LVL uh, ledger boards all the way down and you make the top one straight or the bottom, however you're measuring it, you can pretty much install these plates anywhere. And because you also have that much room over here and that much room over here, if you need to shift these plates on the outside of this LVL, you can do so. All you need to do is mark the bottom here and then measure out where the on center is for this plate. Mark it on your LVL beam down here on the ground. You can pre-drill these holes, slide them up and put like a nail or a little screw to hold them up so they don't fall out. But I can promise you these are already tight in here. They won't fall down as you got a couple guys picking this plate up and putting it against the wall. But it's that that you need to get 100% level and to make sure that your elevation and stuff is fine. So that's why these plates are so good and the system is so good because there's so much room for adjustability. Now just to show you, these plates here are actually not for the LVL. These plates here are just for traditional lumber because these ones are actually going to go on the outside of the house which is going to hold the deck on. I did not want to put LVL on the outside to get rained on and exposed so we are going to use traditional lumber um, this is not treated this is just for where the windows are that are going to hold up so as you can see this is going to hold a piece of treated lumber on the outside of the house as you can see it's already held on there and doesn't want to fall off but we can go ahead and put a little screw up here so as we're lifting this up but this is going to basically sit up in here get bolted in held on there and then we'll go ahead and use brackets that hang down from here and go down and that's actually what is going to hold and support the floor joists. It's Monday the 27th again so we got a few more things that we have to do before we can pour. Um, we still need to install all of the pins that go in here to hold these stakes down in. We need to finish the plates I bought a few more 2x12s that we need to go ahead and finish these walls out because they obviously need super reinforced. We need to put wood going up the sides, the top and back down. We need to kind of put in a cross pattern to hold up the concrete. And if you notice up here, I went ahead and did what the engineer said. Above the windows basically need extra rebar. So if you look up in there above the windows, We've got an extra piece of rebar on the bottom and I went ahead and even put an extra piece of rebar on top. Now that basically is going to act as the windows header and that's going to what is going to support all of the weight so that this doesn't crack and break. Now is that extra rebar four pieces going through top and bottom needed? Probably not. That piece of concrete there is 21 and a half inches thick and it's six inches wide. There's no way that a load is probably going to break that concrete. But again, the engineer said put an extra piece in there. I went ahead and put one extra piece on top of that. So that pretty much guarantees that that window uh, or these windows are going to stay there for the rest of the time. And here's just the top view of what I'm talking about. Extra piece of rebar above the window on the bottom. Extra piece of rebar up on top. They don't run the full length, but they basically go way over the distance of where the window uh, actually starts and finishes. The other question my dad had is, how are we going to do the beam pocket? Well, simple. I basically cut out this piece of foam uh, 14 inches down, which is the thickness of the beam. It's the thickness of the floor trusses, and it's the thickness of where the bottom of these plates are. So everything is going to be 14 inches down. I took a piece of foam here and I took another piece of foam and then I put a little piece of wood in, in between it. So basically this gives me about a three and a half inch pocket that's going to sit in this concrete. And now you can also see why these taper blocks are important. If you didn't have this taper block from the back side of this beam to the inside of the foam from here to here you'd only have about two and a half inches more than enough to support this that it wouldn't fall or break but as you can see having that extra uh, concrete in here for this taper brings this out to about five and a half inches so it basically just super reinforces this with concrete where you're already weakening the concrete so this foam and wood is all taped up so after this concrete is poured we'll go ahead and remove the bracing 
and then we'll basically chisel this foam out and it'll be super easy because the tape should separate the foam from the concrete chisel this out and you will be left with a perfect 14 by five and a quarter inch pocket for three LVL beams to sit in here and run all the way across over to there and then of course the main beam will see be supported three times by heavy four inch poles that hold all of this up. One more thing that we have to do before we're ready to pour is we also have to get all of the vertical rebar in and the engineer has that specked out 18 inches on center and for every window I think we need uh, two more pieces basically side by side. So we'll go ahead and mark 18 inches all the way down and around the entire perimeter. And then right here where this window ends, I'll probably choose on this side. We'll go ahead and put two pieces of rebar going down this way on each side of each window. So basically you make a cage around this window so that it's more reinforced with rebar. The absolute last thing that we have to do is we have to think about all of the sleeves that need to go through the wall. I do not want to be drilling through concrete at a later time and I also don't want to accidentally hit a piece of rebar and worry about having to drill through that. So I just went to Home Depot along with getting the 2x12s to finish out all of the windows. I went ahead and got enough PVC Schedule 40 for all of the sleeves. Now I calculated that we're going to need the sump pump is going to have to run through a sleeve. We're going to have the septic in this spot over here too because the septic tank is going to go about right here and go out to the front in a mound system. We're going to need to bring in the well over here, the well electric, that's four. We're going to need the actual electric coming in to the utility room over there, which is five. And then we're going to need the gas line that comes in and then I'm gonna make a hole going through the house into the garage for a gas line and an electric. I haven't fully decided yet, but I may install a second smaller electrical panel in the garage, so that way the garage will run a boiler, it will run 240 outlets, it'll run enough lighting, um, everything that's needed basically is gonna go almost be a second home since that's gonna be heated out there and probably air conditioning too. So we need to get PVC going through there to run that. Now, if I don't run a second panel through there, I'll just run the electric and the gas line through there to its own boiler. But it'll probably make more sense to run a second panel. That way, if the boiler kicks on while the uh, lift is going up and down and while maybe someone else is running a power tool or something, if uh, a breaker uh, kicks off or something I'll have the panel right there to kick on instead of having to come all the way into the house going downstairs going into the utility room and then resetting the breaker but we'll make sure that a breaker will never trip because we'll make enough uh, outlets on the breaker and we'll make sure that the power is adequate uh, for each size
right, there you have it. There's our progress one month into the build. Thank you again for all 100 subscribers that we're uh, quickly approaching. And we went ahead and show you how we got our windows in. We went ahead and show you how our floor system is going to work. We're going to show you how our beam pocket's going to work on each side that are going to hold the main beam. We're going to get our conduit in and our sleeves for all the septic and well and gas and all that stuff. And then on this Saturday, hopefully we'll be ready to pour. And we're going to go ahead and finish this off now. Hope you guys enjoy. Please like and subscribe. And we will see you on Saturday for the pour.